Hello, and welcome to another episode of this Janine Says podcast. In this week's podcast, we talk about addiction, we talk about trauma, and we talk about the role that therapy even plays um, with the recovery to addiction. So if you are affected by anything we talk about in this podcast today, such as addiction, or want to talk about trauma or help any sort of recovery in your life through addiction, BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that can support this. It is very affordable. There is online um, Zoom calls. You can talk to them over text. Um, and it's a very, very good tool in this recovery process of addiction. So if you want 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, you can use betterhelp.com slash Sinead. That is betterhelp.com slash Sinead. This week we have Dr. Elisa Hollerman, PhD, JD, and female founder of Recovery Management Agency. Um, this is the first agency devoted to helping addicts heal their addictions by awakening their souls. He is also, um, and you also have a book called Soul Briety, um, which I just finished, which blew my mind away. It was so good. I actually loved it <laughs> so much. I read it so fast as well because I was like, oh, what happens next? And it was very, very um, engaging. And I constantly get asked, people will ask me questions on, Sinead, what, do, what book can I read for addiction? And I highly recommend this book because it brings in a whole array of things such as really touching on trauma as you kind of went into detail. We will go into it, but like, as in like trauma kind of was the reason that, well, is the main reason for how addiction plays out in your life in all aspects. Um, and then you touched on soul, soul variety in terms of, you know, this is the way forward is to get in touch with your soul and you and it's a lack of self-awareness and like who we truly are that leads to addiction. Um, First of all, hello and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your kind words about the book. That's so sweet. And thank you so much for having me on. I look, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And safe to say like you've had a very 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 interesting life um I literally am looking at you like how are you this young but I've experienced so much because there was a lot that went on in every chapter because the chapter the chapters kind of um go into your clients and then come back to you and then your clients so it's kind of like a two-in-one book of helping plus your own story which was really really um amazing to hear because um some of the stories I was like wow like the one about the Oscars we will get into but anyway um (laughs) so firstly tell us about your because I always say this and I've I've noticed a massive pattern in all the guests who are really passionate about things is that Mm -hmm. they're uh, passionate because they're experts on experience Mm -hmm. and you're an expert in experience with addiction Mm -hmm. and even at the start of the book I was like whoa like you were in a hotel room sniffing coke uh by yourself and it was just like really intense it really hooked me at the beginning of the book um and then you had your journey into soul writing as you call it so you are I think at the end of the book you were five years sober at the time I don't know how many years so um no I've been sober now 20 and a half okay. years I think I finished the, you know, the book's been out only a few months, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wrote the book well into my, you know, 18, 19 years of sobriety. Amazing. Um, So first I'd like to tell us about your journey, because I'm sure it's going to help people bring awareness to their own addictions and how they can help. So sure. Sure. So I didn't start drinking alcohol until I was 17. And from the moment I drank the first sip, I was like, this is disgusting. And this is amazing. At the same time, this gives me such relief and takes away a lot of my fears and insecurities and inhibitions. Um, From then on, I, my only goal was just drink to get drunk. I was never a someone that enjoyed alcohol, never enjoyed the taste of it, never was just a little bit tipsy. It was like, oh, this is what this is for. And that was the only purpose for me. Um, I did drink for sure alcoholically back in college, but it was still manageable. I wasn't aware that I was drinking more than everybody else because it was such a part of the culture. But in retrospect, going back and looking at it, I can see that I was um, in lots of different ways. 
And I really did not start using, I smoked a little bit of weed, but it was not something that I loved to do. I was always the one who would smoke and then be like, why did I just do that? I, I now I'm paranoid and, and I can't get anything done. And I liked to be pretty much in control. So those were more of the drugs that I tended to do um, in the beginning. And so um, after college, I went to law school. I practiced law in New York City for a minute and then was living with my boyfriend, decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to marry my boyfriend, didn't want to move to the suburbs and moved to Los Angeles with my sister. But I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to practice law anymore, but I didn't really have a plan. And so I got a job as a cocktail waitress, as any good alcoholic would, while I was figuring that out. And someone guided me towards working in the entertainment business, which I didn't know anything about. This was the mid 90s. And this is pre-internet, so I wasn't really aware of what a talent agency even was. But I walked in and interviewed, and it was just immediate energy, and it seemed really fun, and everybody was very young and social. And once I got started as an assistant, I realized, okay, this is a job that I could really use my law degree and continue to work my way up. I could see a path towards a career. So that's where I started drinking the whole time. Um, and then something very traumatic happened. I lost a friend of mine in a very traumatic way, one of my best friends. And then I was introduced to cocaine. And it was really the cocaine that saved me in the beginning. You know, I always say that no one wakes up and says, I want to be a drug addict or an alcoholic. It happens slowly over time and it's subtle. And usually we start drinking or using to disconnect from something else, to push away some sort of pain, to sort of make ourselves feel better as quickly as possible. And for a lot of us, it's the solution until it becomes the problem. But by the time it becomes a problem, it's still the only solution we've known and we haven't really put together enough skill sets or coping mechanisms or healthy ones at that to be able to have another way out. So for me, I was suffering from extreme PTSD after my friend passed away, was not getting help for it, never went to see a clinician or anything and started using cocaine as something that was soothing me in those moments. And from there, it kind of took off over the next eight years. And what was, quote unquote, fun or partying or a lot of acceptable behavior at the end started to become extremely dark and isolating and dangerous. So I knew that if I didn't get sober the day that I did, that I would probably die and believe that and ask for help. Yeah. Amazing. And um, I think as well, and I've been in the inter entertainment um, agency as well, like um, working with a lot of DJs, even the likes of like Avicii and stuff like that, like, and watching all those things pan out and the entertainment industry can be such a damaging place, especially for someone who has um, unhealed trauma, because for some people it's fun, it's a party drug and um, it can be taken in moderation, but for people who are really trying to escape the world um, it can become a very dangerous, dangerous road and can lead to such heartaches. But um, you also talked about all different types of, you know, addictions in terms of like shopping and Mm -hmm. shopping drinking drugs love um even sex and you know intimacy and stuff like that and then do you truly believe that these things become addictions because of the unhealed 
trauma like what has trauma got to lead because you talked about a lot of different traumas and you brought them up which I think is amazing because when people talk about their own traumas it can actually bring up other people's traumas because you talked about even simple traumas like um your mom was it your mom was having an affair yes sure yeah that was yeah. like you know you were so young there it was kind of like a passing by but when you look back at it you were like that's traumatic that's how I see yeah. relationships um you know your mom was also dealing with addiction as well at some point in yeah. her life and then you also had the friend pass and there was all these different types of traumas and I thought that was amazing because you know looking back you don't you we can't really decide what it is a trauma but when you were bringing them up I was like okay maybe that's a trauma and that's a trauma and yeah and these are things to be healed from um so yeah how can we you know distinguish what is a trauma and how it's affecting us yeah great question so when we think about there are no little traumas trauma is mm -hmm. subjective and it's anything that takes that person any any event that takes that person out of their sort of window of tolerance their ability to self-regulate and there are different types of trauma so there's an acute trauma which i think is what most people think of whether it's a violent act or an assault or a car accident or a death something that's a one-time event that is, you know, when something is unexpected or when something has never happened before, or when your body is going into that fight or flight or can't fight back or flee and therefore is frozen, that is when we experience something that is traumatic and it sort of slows down time. And, you know, sometimes people will say they were in a car accident and it felt like everything was happening in slow motion or this horrible thing happened and it felt like they were looking down on themselves and they were dissociating. So our bodies and our spirits are meant to self-regulate. They're meant to protect us. Our brains are meant to protect us from this overwhelming amount of information that will break us essentially. And so we have all of these protective ways that our brains and our bodies will go into. What happens though with someone that's traumatized is that instead of afterwards them being able to work through that quickly and process that information, it gets stuck. It gets stuck on a cellular level in our bodies, our memories get fragmented, and we end up having these, what I call soul loss, and these open sort of wounds where we put these little post-its on our soul and create this narrative of, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, no one will ever love me, or whatever it is. And then we end up having these triggers that will happen in our day-to-day -day lives where maybe you'll be in a relationship and someone will say to you, well, what would you like to have for dinner tonight? Do you want to, you know, why don't we go get Italian? You always want Chinese, like let's get Italian. And you hear that as, oh my God, he doesn't love me. He doesn't want to get the food that I want. He he hates me. He's putting me down. He thinks I'm fat. He, I only eat Chinese food. And we start making up right? And it hits us as like from one to 10 or 15, when in reality, it was like an annoying comment. And so that is some of the ways that trauma will show up. Another type of trauma is what we call chronic trauma, which is a smaller event that's happening over time consistently. So maybe someone is being bullied in school, Maybe you're working for a narcissistic boss who is emotionally abusing you. Maybe you're in a very unhealthy relationship. Maybe you have a parent that has been suffering from their own trauma or their own substance abuse problem and is inconsistent in how they show up for you. And so you're never quite sure what you're going to get. So when these things are consistently happening, albeit one time the mom forgot to pick up their son at school 
that would be traumatic, but it wouldn't be chronic. But if they were the kind of parent who was constantly missing things and constantly not showing up and constantly forgetting, then that would be more of a chronic trauma that was happening. And then a complex trauma, which is more of both of those things put together. And, you know, when we're looking to see if something's traumatic, we're looking for, are we having a bigger reaction that might be appropriate in the moment? Are we having difficulty sleeping? Are we having difficulty connecting to others, making friends, participating? Are we having difficulty, you know, in certain places or talking about certain things? So there's lots of little things to be looking for. It's always best to get assessed by someone that's a trauma-focused um, therapist that can really help you to distinguish what is going on. You would think that they teach trauma specifically in med school or even if you're getting you know, a license in psychology. And the truth is they really don't. These are added courses and added classes that one has to seek out on their own. So it's very important to find someone that is qualified and not just trauma informed, but really trauma focused, especially if you think this is something that might be going on for you. And then to just answer your other question, I do believe first and foremost, that A, a lot of us have suffered trauma. And if we haven't, certainly in the last three years with the pandemic, with everything that's been going on, just by getting it in that way and our life changing and us sort of having to stand still has been traumatic and, in, and very stressful. Now, not everybody's gonna react the same way. Some people are going to have a really hard time and not be able to move through that trauma and it's going to stick with them. And that's based on what, what their other, what their childhood was like, what environment they're in, how, you know, is there any other mental health issues going on? You know, it really depends on the person and that's why you should never compare your trauma to anybody else because it is so subjective. Should I shut that? Oh, I can't hear. Okay, because it is so subjective as to the individual person. And most people who are struggling with addiction, it has been or substance abuse, or like I say, any of these other things where you're looking for an immediate solution outside of yourself to fix an inner problem. So whether it's shopping or relationships or food or any of these things it's we're trying to look at something outside of ourselves which really has a very short expiration date on it they're really not long lasting solutions so whether you're actually suffering from the disease of addiction or you're just reaching out it's definitely something to look at right because the solution is the inner work. It's what we have to do on the inside. And that's why I talk about it being so important to know what lies underneath. A lot of soul work is about learning to understand what lies unconsciously in within our psyches and how to make what's unknown known and how we really can stop pathologizing everything and use some of the things in a non-pathologizing, but rather strength affirming way to approach our suffering. Yeah. Um, we will go into, you know, the ways in which you do help people with addiction, but first I'd really like people to understand how can we understand the addict and um, I personally dealt with an addict myself and it's one of the hardest things because they're literally like an amazing person they have so many but they have this disease but also um not wanting to deal with any like for me I've done a lot of a lot of work and I I, I understand the trauma 
is usually the reason why this addiction like it's a massive avoidant avoidant um mm-hmm. uh situation it's kind of like just it just lo- like even looking at it like when I look back and you're telling me now it's just massive avoidance of everything that's happened in their life and it's just like a way to escape um but in your book obviously you went through a whole different type of um like a load of your clients and it was really good to see and understand the addict because sometimes all you can see is the behavior and it can be really hurtful and damaging to family members and loved ones but when you look truly at the addict with who has trauma it can be very but then also there's like unless they want help like when I'd been there and tried to like okay let's talk about your childhood and your trauma and let's get you to such and such they're like no no so how can we understand and how can we help and how can we push them into you know a recovery state rather than avoidance of where where they are because I'm sure a lot of people listen to this dealt with addiction and have you know addiction in their loved ones where can we start to understand them and how can we get them in the right direction so yeah there's a lot of pieces to that Sorry. <laughs> So let's break it down. So basically knowing why the person is suffering, not all the time we're going to know. We're not going to know their traumas necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if we do, if we have a glimpse into it and we, you know, we're not going to do is pinpoint them for them. We're not going to go, well, your parents were divorced and you lost your job and clearly you have trauma And so this is why you're drinking too much and you don't really need to go to treatment. So it's more for us to have an understanding that, you know, someone who is suffering with an addiction is in a lot of pain and they really haven't been able to have another solution. And once you're struggling, your brain is now operating differently in the sense that you're, you know, if you back to neuroscience 101, so you have this back part of your brain that's responsible for your body temperature and your heart beating and your breathing if you're not paying attention, right? And your fight or flight mechanism, your survival mechanism. We also have the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for decision making and logical thinking and going off of our memories and making choices and so on. What happens is there's a, if you're, let's say, walking through the woods and you have a healthy brain and you see a bear, before you even have time to think in the front part, The back part takes over your survival and you start running, right? A couple of seconds later, milliseconds later, your front brain comes online and sends a message to the back part of your brain that they're going to sort of take over now and make a decision. Go off logical thinking, memories. I saw this on Bear Grylls one time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to look for a house. I'm going to climb a tree, whatever it is. And essentially, that's how your brain would work in that kind of a fight or flight environment. What happens with that ability between the stop and start switch between the back and the front is that your brain now looks at this alcohol or drug addiction or whatever the addiction is, it's getting such a big dopamine hit. And when we get a dopamine hit, we're taught that this is something we need in order to survive. So we know without a doubt, we get big dopamine hits when we have water, when we eat food, when we procreate, things like that, right? But what happens is we need more and more and more of the substances. So as we take more and more and more of the substances to get more and more and more of a dopamine hit, our brains are now saying we need that thing like we need air, food, and water. And we will stop at nothing in order to keep doing that. So we lose the ability at that point in time to make a rational decision, to make, to remind ourselves in that moment, oh, well, last time I did this, these were the consequences. Or, you know, I know my parents really love me, but you know, they're like, their brains are telling them, you need this, you need to keep doing it, because we need this head of dopamine. And 
it's as simple as that. So it's, it's less about knowing what their traumas are. That brings a sort of empathy to the equation in, you know, it's not a pass, but it's an understanding. And I think it's a better understanding and a more empathetic way of looking at addiction and recognizing that it's not a choice. That being said, they're also not in their quote unquote right mind to be making decisions, which is why really awesome people from all sorts of, you know, backgrounds and genders and races and ethnicities and socioeconomic, you know, everyone makes, it can become, a, you know, an addict because it just, it just knows no boundaries whatsoever. And that's the hard part. If we could love someone enough to help them stop, right, we wouldn't have this epidemic that we're having, but we can't. So what is, what do we do to answer your next question? We have to find these windows of opportunity. There are moments where that person is coming down or having that remorse, that shame, that, right, they're coming back online, so to speak where the addiction isn't running the show and we're seeing more of their authentic self and that person that we know and they're suffering. And so a lot of us want to go in and say, this is what's wrong. This, you're an addict, you're this, you're this, you're this. And we want to try to refrain from using the word you and coming at it with all I statements of when this is happening, I am scared you're going to die. I feel like X, Y, and Z. I'm scared if we don't find someone to help us that X, Y, and Z. And not coming at them with what the problem is, because believe me, they're well aware of what the problem is, but coming to them maybe with solution of here's a number to call. I spoke to this person. They're willing to get on the phone with you. Will you call them? Here it is. And that's it. And kind of leave it unless you're ready to hire an addiction, you know, a person that specializes in addiction that can do an intervention and really help guide you through that process. But if it's a confrontation, it's always best to go in with I, it's always best to go in when they're in that really, their walls are down, maybe start a conversation with, hey, is now a good time to talk? Like there's a lot on my mind. And I, I, you know, is now, is now a good time. And because when you ask permission to have a serious conversation, it allows for someone's walls to drop because now they've said, yeah, yeah, it's a good time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so immediately they're going and sinking down into a much more open place. And you want to try to imagine that you're having, when we say a heart to heart conversation, we really mean that you're speaking from your heart and trying to connect with theirs. Because if you're trying to have a logical conversation of boom, 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 that's not where they're at right now. They're in deep pain and they need help and support. Yeah. Thank you for that. Cause I feel like they're, that will be very useful for people dealing with addiction. Um, and, you know, for anyone who, you know, as an addict or even yourself, um, what is the moment of I am an addict? You know, what does it take to sort of cross that line? Did you always sort of know that you knew there was a problem because you needed it? Or was there like a moment of like, crap, this is a problem? I definitely didn't. In the beginning, I didn't think I had any sort of problem. Like I thought, everything I was doing was perfectly fine. There was a point where my therapist said to me, you know, having cocaine in your bag is not, is not, it's not like having gum, like that's not appropriate. And I was really like, really? Like, what, what do you mean? There was, everything was quote unquote working for me in the beginning. And um, as far as I was concerned, like there were no changes that needed to happen eventually things started to get messy, but I never thought I was an alcoholic or a drug addict. Never one time did I even, it occurred to me. 
I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know what was going on. Um, as I do talk about in the book, my mom was suffering from addiction. We didn't know it. And so I just thought there was really something wrong with her. You know, we did have the episode where she was in, um, where we did have to do a psychiatric hold on her. It was because she was detoxing too quickly and we didn't know. So I just thought I was sort of destined to go that route. I didn't know she was not, I didn't know I didn't know I had a problem. But as time went on, and certainly towards the end, and certainly in that, you know, in that scene that I wrote in the hotel, I knew something was very wrong with me. But I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know. And I was so ashamed to ask for help or tell anyone because it was so out of character for me to even be living this life. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was crazy. I knew it was dirty. I knew that I had a lot of issues, but I did not know what to do about it. And I was scared. I was really scared to death. And it wasn't until I was faced with another traumatic moment where I was sort of going back into that old PTSD from when my friend had passed away from suicide that I really heard this loud voice that said, if this friend passes away or dies, you will not survive. You will become a serious drug addict. Mind you, I already was a pretty serious drug addict and you will die. And then my next thought, as I was sitting next to my six month old nephew and looking into his eyes while I was out of control and he was super calm was, no, you are not allowed to die. You have to show up for him and you have to get better. And the only thing I could manage to do was call my therapist and say, what should I do? Should I go to one of those meetings or something? Because at this point, I'd lived in LA long enough to know what a 12-step meeting was, but that's really the extent of what I knew. And then, you know, you talk at the end about steps, but what was the stepping stones for you? going out did you, I, I don't think I read that you relapsed or anything but um, I did yeah I did not yeah. relapse but when so that's when I got sober was in 2002 after I got sober I had that is when I really had a career that is when I really had a successful career as an agent and that was all these things were coming true that I wanted or that I thought I needed, but I was very much gravitating towards new things, new shiny new toys, new things to make me feel better. And yes, I was staying sober from drugs and alcohol, but I was becoming a workaholic. I wanted more and more and more whatever the next thing was that I could accomplish. And at five years sober, I really found myself in a place of unhappiness where I was forced to really look at, well, you know, I'm sober, I've made it five years and I, you know, I have these things that I thought I wanted and like, how could I possibly be unhappy? And what does that mean? And I knew I was at that crossroads if I, if I don't do anything about that or really start to look at what that is. I probably would relapse because that's, I had seen that happen so many times before. So that's when I began to dig a little deeper, get a little bit more curious, read a lot of books, look at other things that might be going on. And that is when I also made a choice to go back. I, I, I went, I was really unhappy with my career and where I was, I thought it was my clients. I thought it was the building I was in. I thought it was the person I worked for. Like, I thought it was all these other things. I wasn't ready to look at what was really underneath it all. But I did decide to go take some classes at UCLA at night in learning about drug and alcohol counseling, because that seemed really interesting to me. And I definitely wanted to start using my brain again in a different way. And so while I was agenting, I was taking classes at night. 
And that's when I started to hear words about trauma and neuroscience. And that's when I started to really learn a lot more than I ever learned um, about what it meant to be suffering from addiction or suffering from trauma. And I was just fascinated that there was all this information and A, I didn't know about it, but I didn't think a lot of other people knew about it either. And that's when I started to really think about maybe doing something else. And that happened really slowly, but eventually, as I talk about, I decided to retire from the entertainment business, went back to school to get my master's and doctorate in psychology. And I focused on depth psychology, which is D-E-P-T-H. And depth psychology is oriented around the unconscious. And it is a belief that, that there is so much information that lies in our unconscious that we have sort of put away or that is very archetypal and old that also lives there. And this became really interesting to me as part of doing my trauma work. Long story short, both fast forward, I'm writing my dissertation and my dissertation question is, can doing soul-centered work really help with long-term recovery from addiction? Mm -hmm. And the answer was across all my participants who had various degrees of sobriety and various different relapse stories, the answer was yes. But the caveat was they didn't know that they were doing it. They didn't know that they were doing soul work. They didn't know that they were connecting to soul. They didn't have language for any of this. So that's when I came up with soul variety of, I really wanted to create a language and give people a way to reconnect with soul, have language about around work that they could be doing on their own, give them back some agency while they were doing all this other work. I don't think that sobriety is um, a separate modality or methodology that is non-inclusive of everything else. For me, it became the golden thread between my trauma work, my 12-step work, you know, my spiritual work and all of it. It just was looking at everything through the lens of soul. And that really connected all the dots for me. And so I talk about what it's like at the end of the book to go on a soul journey and the 12 stages so that people can see themselves at one of the stages, essentially, and really not be so afraid of what's going to happen next or that they're only going to be in this dark moment. Part of doing soul work is really recognizing that everything is not meant to always be okay. And we're not always meant to feel happy that the things that we go through and the struggles and the suffering and the loss and the grief and the heartbreak are the things that are going to help us, like I say, to grow down and help us to make meaning out of the experiences that happen in our life. And that doing soul work is about creating meaning. And what was happening for me essentially is I was losing a sense of connection to myself, a connection to others. I lost the ability to make meaning in my life. And I was forced into this underworld of darkness and I didn't know how to get out. And so that's what the soul journey is really meant to identify where you are in that process and not be afraid of the dark, but rather know that that's where you're going to be able to alchemize your pain into purpose. Yeah. And could you let us know, like, what does soul work look like or a little example of it? Or, you know, is it different to trauma work? Is it all working together? Um, yeah, just give people an example of like what soul writing and soul work is. Sure. So soul is not an easy definable word, right? It's not something we can point to 
or just come up with a definition of that is going to connect with everyone. So that's why when I talk about soul, I talk about story. I talk about imagery. I talk about mythology. Um, these are all ways that we can connect with something that is so distinct and personal, right? And so for me, soul is the essence of who I am. It is my unique way of showing up in this world. I talk about the acorn theory that James Hillman talks about, which is that this belief that like an acorn is predestined to grow into a beautiful oak tree with no instruction, we too have our authentic soul that if we follow and we listen to the whispers, those intuitions, those moments, that we will be guided and that is the way that we can move forward. Now, we don't listen. We have self-will. We get scared. We live in fear. Questions are too big. All of these things happen. And so inevitably, we end up having right these tragedies and these difficulties in our life. And soul work is about being able to make the meaning from that. So it's really being able to create a place in that dark where we have created imagery around a place to go. You know, me and you were talking before we got on the call about meditation and how essential that's been for you. And a lot of people will go into a meditation or I can't meditate or I can't get to that space or they have that difficulty. And I'm talking about something like as far as even open eyes, active imagination, like really saying, okay, I'm suffering enormously right now. And it feels like I've been broken into pieces and it feels like a piece of me is missing or I'm never going to be the same and put an image to that. So for me, I talk about the point where something traumatic happened and it felt like I was in pieces on the kitchen floor. And then really taking that image and closing my eyes and going to a place, for me, it's the cave, which I've decorated beautifully so that I'm comfortable there. And there's candles so that it's lit. And I go there and I can look at the pieces and one by one allow for them to come back together. But it's going to take time and it's going to, it requires patience and it requires curiosity. And it's really leaning into this aspect that is the essence of doing the soul work. It's not just about feeling good, but it's about understanding how to feel bad. Yeah. Um, and just noting on that as well, if anyone wanted to know more about how you can find your soul three things like meditation, like I like to explain meditation in terms of when we when we come out as babies like we are perfect we are enough we are born enough and then we go throughout life and we have all these condition patterns of how we should be from our parents from school how to be cool what our job should look like and it's this negative thought pattern that we constantly tell ourselves in this belief system so when we sit down to meditate people are like but what I always tell people when you start meditating and two years later you're not going to know yourself and they're like well why do I not want to know myself and I'm like because that's not the real you that is the you that is like conditioned and you know made up of all the belief systems and negative thought patterns that you have when you sit down and meditate you will be aware of everyone else's chatter everyone else's negative chatter your own negative chatter your own belief systems that come from everywhere and you start to pick them apart you start to say okay where did I get this belief that my body should look a certain way okay let's look at that and then you start to tear away tear away and each thought comes in we tear it away and we tear it away and we become ob observant become so observant of it and we don't become our thoughts and then that is when true soul for me comes through like that is when I find myself whenever I remove those people's words and those people's thoughts and then in these moments of silence like this pure energy soul for me comes in mm. and then I always tell people like when you're meditating regularly 
or doing the soul work like this, you're going to have all these ideas, creative ideas. You're going to have these pushes yes. to go different career, to maybe leave your partner, to maybe do these things. And that's your true self coming in. And that comes as well with like long practices of meditation and sitting with yourself and really finding yourself. And that's like what I try to push as well. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what I meant as well by like, you know, meditating to, to find yourself. I always say that like, it is you that's always there and you need to push away all these other things to like become you. And then, you know, we always say as well, like the universe whispers until it shouts. So you have these feelings of anxiety whenever you're doing something that's not connected to your soul. Um, mm-hmm. maybe you're with the wrong person you're in the wrong job and yes. people don't listen to that feeling of anxiety and then they sit in the anxiety they sit in the job they hate they sit in a relationship they don't like and they just don't listen so then it's just piling up and then it becomes chronic and then it's just you know maybe they do reach for these things to try and escape and it's you know it's kind of like all pieced into one big soul work as you said like this is kind of finding yourself is probably a big massive part of overcoming addiction because like you're running away from everything that's happened when in fact you need to find who you are all right yes I love the way that you put it and that is you know an excellent way and in the book I talk about those those other voices right that we yeah. created about personal was that you, you had to say? yeah really yeah, personifying, personifying those other parts of ourselves yeah and you know for me there was Trixie mm-hmm. excuse me who was my who very quickly on I named my addiction because I needed to feel like that behavior was someone else and that thinking that I still had, even though I was abstinent, was something other than my, 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 myself, Elisa. And so I didn't really know I was doing soul work, right? I didn't know that I was separating parts of myself from my soul self, that essentially that's what I was trying to do. It wasn't until many, many years later when I studied it that I recognized, okay, well, I have Trixie, I named her, but I didn't really explore what she looked like or what her personality is, or, you know, she's very much her own person when once I was able to personify her. And then, you know, I'm able to dialogue with her and really listen to what she has to say and what she has to share, because sometimes it's not it's not necessarily just quote unquote negative. It's, it's, you know, she's picking up on something that maybe I'm not, she's picking up on an old trauma or something that's showing up and she's saying, this feels like this. And this is why I'm saying this. And it, it leads me to be able to maybe pull the string a little bit as to, okay, let me go back. Let me see what this is. And So, you know, that's another way we don't have to completely go into a state where we're just right waiting for that aha moment. It's not going to be as quick as that, essentially, but it's, you know, all of these are different gateways into soul. And I think, you know, for me, that felt sense of soul, like when I know I'm connected is when I feel that sense of home, when I feel safe, when I feel like I'm in flow, at peace, in awe. And if we can connect to what makes us feel like that, do more of that is the way that we can care for our soul, then really being able to listen to those whispers that you spoke about, which is really stage two of the soul journey is whether we choose to listen to those whispers. We don't have to take a leap of faith right away because that's stage five. We can start to slowly listen to the whispers, but not keep shushing them away. Because like you said, the whispers will become louder and louder and louder and louder. 
until a brick house falls on your head and you're forced to sit there and do nothing else but deal with the issue at hand. Yeah. And I just want to say like how amazing it is to personify as well, because, you know, it's weird looking at an addict whenever, you know, all the actions and everyone I'd say just like, leave them alone. Like they're doing all this stuff and you see them who, for who they are and you're like they, that something's wrong and also the bad behaviors are because of the addiction and not because of the person and I yeah. feel like if the addict can also personify their the bad things that they do into like what you call Trixie it's easier to separate themselves instead of living with all this guilt that they have you know done all these bad actions you know, so I think it's such a beautiful way. So if anyone is suffering with addiction, I feel like have a read of this book and look into personifying your person. You had a few, you had like Trixie and Gwen, Gwen, I think, and yeah, like that's Gwen, a real short pants and yeah, yeah, short pants. Yeah. Um, so I think for them to, to do that makes them free a little bit, like allows them to be free and be like, no, I actually am a good person because if anything that I've seen with addiction is that these people are still like amazing lovable human beings um, and yeah. and then this is just taking over them and um before we finish can we please have a, a success story I feel like some people could rather be stuck in addiction or they have someone that is stuck in addiction and sometimes you're like I'm an addict I can't get rid of this blah blah, blah. and what I found through your book is like through all your clients, they all came through it with all the soul work, their own therapy, meditations and everything that they were doing. Um, you know, can we get a success story of how maybe one of your clients or whoever you want to talk about going through this section and how they've come out and how, you know, how people are doing it now just to help people know that there is hope. There's always hope um, as long as you're still here and as long as you're still showing up. There's always hope. I, you know, there's clients that I've had that I've had gone on to have a lot of success. And there's clients that I've lost along the way because they, it was incredibly difficult for them to look at that underlying work or get the support that they needed. Um, and you know, and it's tragic. But for me, the success story for me and the way that I look at success and now define success with my clients is the ability to keep showing up, the ability to keep trying, the ability to keep healing. And it's not about what happened today. It's about what you're going to do tomorrow. And if someone slips or relapses, it should not be looked at as something that's shameful or that they can't come back from. To me, it's shining a light on a piece of the puzzle that hasn't yet been healed. And it's information. Now, it's what you do with that information day two that we have to look at. So, you know, I think that counting days and having birthdays and having anniversaries is something to be celebrated. But for those people that are suffering in putting days together or with chronic relapses that still keep showing up to keep trying. To me, that's success at its best because that is incredibly hard to do. And those are the, those are the moments where you really want to look at what's lying underneath what's lying underneath the addiction and asking the question of like, why, what am I, what am I running from? What am I feeling? What am I trying to get away from? And why am I trying to punish myself? Or, you know, these bigger questions that we want to look at and get that help and support to go a little bit deeper. Amazing. Um, well, we'll leave it there for today. And thank you so much for coming on. And thanks to thank listeners you. for listening. Um, can you just let us know where we can find you? Um, all about the book. And yeah, let, let us know everything. Yes, absolutely. So you can buy the book anywhere books are sold, Amazon and Target and Walmart and all those great places online. Of course, your local bookstores. Um, we always want to support. And um, 
information about my company, Recovery Management Agency, you can find online on my website, which is D as in David, R as in Robert, Hallerman.com. And you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Alisa Hallerman, Dr. Alisa Hallerman. Amazing. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is an awesome conversation. Thank you. Thank you.